All right, we are recording. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna do a, a brief review of this paper that Subutai sent out, it's a very recent paper, 2020, by Andre Bukansky and Neil Burgess. Um, and, and then I'm going to talk about how it got me thinking about something, which uh, I wrote in a note uh, last week on Friday. Um, so it's sort of two topics that are intersecting briefly, and I'm gonna try to keep this short, given that I know that uh, some of you have a short time today, including me. So, um, so this as a review paper, uh, it's very well written, although I had to read it a couple of times to really absorb it. That's not the way it's written. It just, it's got a lot of dense stuff in it. So it's a lot of terminology, both on the anatomy and the different types of cell types. Which, so I just had to get my mind around it a bit. Um, so it's, it's essentially saying that a lot of it's been written about uh, grid cells and play cells. And these are cells that fire when an animal's at some location in an environment. We're talking rats here almost completely. Um, but vector coding cells are cells that uh, respond to an object or something at some vector from the animal, at some distance in orientation from the animal. So a border vector cell or, or, or say a boundary vector cell is a, is a cell that fires when there's a boundary at you know, some position and distance from the animal. So it's a distance and a direction, and that's why it's a vector. So this is a review of all the different vector coding cells saying, we're not gonna talk about grid cells and, and, and play cells. We're gonna just about vector coding cells and, and do a review of those. So, so that's what this paper is about. Any questions about that basic intent yet? Okay, so um, they go through and they basically list a whole bunch, all the different types of vector cells that people have found. Um, so there's Boundary vector cells, there's border cells, there's landmark vector cells, there's object vector cells. Um, this trace vector cells are a little different. Um, and, and so they, they go through and they, they describe what these different cells are and how they work. So um, this, this figure here, figure one, is essentially um, talking about the nature of vector cells. So if a person was at some orientation, uh, there'd be cells that, they, they, they make this little rosette pattern saying, if you're, this is you, the triangle, and you're in some room, or the rats in a room, there'll be cells that, that there should be some cells that require that when there's an object or a boundary at some uh, distance and orientation. And most of these cells are allocentric. So that means that this is a, a boundary in the room, it's not relative to you. So if it's an allocentric cell, you could be spinning around here, but as long as there's some vector in some distance in the room, allocentric, these cells fire. And they make the argument that there's a complete map for all these vector cells. So Around the, the rat, there's a set of cells that are representing close things and further things and further things and further things, so distance and direction. And, and that's, this figure is just sort of illustrating what the, that, that property is. Um, then this, this table is a list of all these cells. Right, just a quick question yeah, on, that, yeah. on that figure. You, you yeah. said it's, it's, is it allocentric in the sense that if you, if you were to turn, the same set of cells would still be active? Yes, yes. Okay, so it's uh, independent of your head direction. Or... It's right, it's independent okay. of your head direction. But they, but one of the, oh my gosh, all of a sudden the huge wind just picked up outside here. It's just like, it's like the tornado just arrived. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are outsensors. But one of the next things they, they point out, and I didn't realize this, they argue that for all the allocentric cells, there are equivalent egocentric cells. So for, if there's a boundary vector cell, normally that's an allocentric cell, but now they have, there are ego uh, boundary vector cells. And if there's a border vector cell, there are ego border vector cells. And if object cells, there are ego object cells. So they, they argue that there's equivalence, uh, there's both ego and allo for every one of these cells. Now, let me just, at this point, let me interject something. These are all found, these are found in different parts of the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, the cervicium, the retrospinal cortex. They're kind of scattered all over the rat's brain. Um, these different cell types. I don't think all of these make sense in the neocortex. I'm not thinking the neocortex has equivalence to all these. This could very well be a rat and animals have been around for a long, long time and they've evolved all kinds of special things for navigation. So when we look at these things, we don't say, oh, the neocortex has to have equivalent of a boundary cell or a vector, you know, this kind of stuff. I don't think so. They might or may not, but I don't view this as a model for how the cortex works. I just view this as sort of general principles and um, about how rats and, and animal and mammals navigate. And some of these principles will apply to the neocortex, but not all of them. So just a, just a point about that. So in this table here, 
Um, I don't know how I lost all my highlights, but I did. Um, so you put, here, put, here you see they say there's a boundary vector cell, and then they say there's an egocentric boundary vector cell right down here. Um, and they say, where is it? Well, the, the boundary vector cells are, this is the L1, it's in subiculum, but down here they're in the retrospinal cortex and the, I don't know, the lateral endoronic cortex and so on. So this is the allocentric, this is egocentric. Um, and so they sort of characterize these things. Um, and then, and so then here is, there are, these are sort of the uh, visual explanations for what those different cell types do. I don't think it's really, really important right here. I'll just give you a flavor for it. Because these words are very confusing. There's border cells and boundary cells. Well, a border cell seems to be a, it's like if the rat can detect it with its whiskers, so it has to be very close. In that sense, it's not really a vector. So if the rat detects there's a wall on its right, that's a border cell. A boundary sector cell is maybe a boundary that's further away, and the rat can't uh, feel it with its whiskers. So the boundary vector cell is really a vector. It has a distance component to it, where the border cell is a separate cell but doesn't have a distance vector. Then there are objects, vector cells, which are essentially, it's not a border, but it's more of a specific feature or thing out there, uh, and so on. Uh, I will, I will throw in that often uh, border cells, uh, often people do think of boundary vector cells as being just more, more generalized border cell. Just a uh, border cell is a specific kind of boundary vector yeah. cell. But I think they argue the op, they argue differently here. Um, oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, well, they say for, well, it maybe it's a different type, but they're, they're physically located differently. So if you look in this chart here, they say a boundary vector cell is in the speculum, but the border cell is in the medial and toronto cortex. It's not like they're mixed together. They make the argument that they're actually separate cells. It's not just one's really close. That's what they argue. Whether it's true, I don't, I don't think it really matters that much. But um, So then they go through the different types of, allocentric border cells or allocentric cells and then they go through um uh, keep going down here there's a lot of text here <laughs> then they go through this this is i believe the uh the egocentric equivalent so this this figure is equivalent to the previous figure it's just talking about what the egocentric cells do um and again the details there's a lot of details here and i'm not going to try to drag through i did read the paper very carefully uh twice uh but the, the basic idea is you got a bunch of these cells, they're sort of object oriented, some are ego, and then there's equivalent of some are allocentric. Um, so, and there's a lot of little details in here that were, were interesting to read about. Um, but then I'm going to skip this one. This had to do with uh, hemispheric um, drop, you know, when it happens and they, they damage one side of the brain or disable it from the other, and what, what occurs when it wasn't that important. Then this one here, this is the figure I sent out last week. Uh, and suggestion you might want to look at. This one is very interesting, um, and it generated a lot of thinking on my part. Um, and when, uh, so basically what they're saying is, oh, by the way, previously the two authors who are writing this review paper, uh, Bukansky and Burgess, they have proposed in the earlier papers a, a network that would convert between an allocentric and an egocentric version of a cell and back again. And so on the left here, you see uh, a sense of uh, these are egocentric border cells or boundary cells, excuse me, egocentric boundary cells. So these are like, hey, if there's a boundary right in front of me, this cell fires. And the boundary to my right, this cell fires. It doesn't matter, you know, that's always the case. It's egocentric. And down here are the equivalent allocentric uh, border vector cells. And so there's a cell that fires when there's a, when there's a, a, boundary, a boundary at some distance away from me but it's always in the same point in the relative to the room or the environment. So it doesn't matter which way I'm facing, the little red triangles mean I can be facing any direction, but this cell says, hey, there's a, there's a boundary at some distance in the north end of this room, not, it doesn't matter which way I'm facing. And so they say, here's how you can get from, one, from this representation, the ego to the allo, here's a, a little uh, sort of schematic diagram of how you could do this. And it's kind of like a lookup table in some sense, and, you, and they say, well, the thing you need to know is you need to know the head direction. And so if you know the head direction, then you can convert back and forth between these two, which is pretty basic. You could say, okay, imagine I'm representing some space. And now I say, oh, well, knowing the head direction, which is an allocentric signal, meaning like I am facing in a particular direction in the room, not, it doesn't matter which I'm facing, you know, relative to the world, it's just a particular room. Um, then I can use that to say how much everything has been rotated. So you imagine a two-dimensional world and you're saying the head direction cell is telling you how much the world is rotated. And so now I can rotate all the different vector, vector elements um, 
and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so as I pointed out, um, but this really got me thinking about, uh, about um, um, reference frame conversions. convergence. I had a little co private conversation with uh, Subutai last week in Slack or in the Slack room or whatever. Um, and we talked about this a bit. And it, it made me realize, you know, we know that the, the brain, the neocortex, everywhere, we have to do these conversions between reference frames. We have to go from like a you know, retinal centric, like the, our thousand brain theory says, you know, you got input coming from the eye and yet we build allocentric models, even in V1. And so it, that tells you that you have to do a reference frame conversion, a reference frame transform. And I never really put my finger on it, I think, before, but it, I, now it's clear to me that this reference frame, tran reference frame transform has to occur in every single cortical column. It's a, it's a basic function of the cortical column. It's not like, oh, we're going to use the where pathway and the what pathway or something like that. No, every column, I believe now, is getting an input and it's going to convert it into another reference frame. If we think about like V1 or V2, it'll be in an egocentric reference frame, relative to retina maybe, retinocentric. Um, um, but it, in other parts of the cortex, it can be whatever reference frame is coming out of some other part of the cortex. So it's a general purpose, like I've got an input in kind of reference frame, and I'm going to convert it to an, another reference frame that I'm going to build a model from. Even in the wear pathway, um, you might have like, I need to go from a retinal centric reference frame, maybe to a head centric reference frame, or to a hand centric reference frame. So I, I now believe that every single column is doing a reference frame transformation. And, and, and it's really hard to imagine how to do that. And this figure was a big clue to me, like, oh, what's going on here? This seems to work. How, what about this? How can we make this work? So I'm just gonna share you some of my observations and I haven't reached a conclusion about this yet, but I feel like I can come up with a general purpose solution here. The first thing, and you interrupt me, if anyone has a question yet, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll pause for a second. Uh, this is a very basic question. It says here on the top right, thalamic head direction neurons. Yeah. What does the thalamus yeah. have to do with this? Uh, you know, that was an interesting question. I, I wondered about that too. Um, first of all, there's head direction cells throughout the rat's brain. They're all over the place. Um, and I, I, I and, and, and they were, they're also in the thalamus. I didn't know that. They're in some of the, um, the, the, inter, the, the, the intralaminar nuclei, you know, the, the ones uh, that are not the, um, the relay cells. And they found cells in there that are head directional. And I'm not sure why they made that distinction right here. I think it might be because in this particular example, uh, I'm guessing here, in this particular example, Notice they're saying the egocentric uh, boundary cells are in the parietal cortex and the, um, uh, in the boundary vector cells here, they don't say where these are actually, um, uh, but they may, uh, they may say, oh, and then they're, they're saying these, these transition cells in between are the retrosplenial cortex up here. And so maybe they're saying in this particular circuit, they know that the thalamic cells project to the retrosplenial cortex. Um, so the answer to your question is, there are head direction cells in the thalamus, at least in the rat. Um, there are lots of other places too. So this is, but in this particular circuit, they might be saying, well, we think these intermediate cells are in the retrospinal cortex and there's, we know that there's a thalamic projection to them. So we're gonna say those, those are the thalamic head direction cells. Um, those are kind of details that I'm trying not to get too hung up on because obviously there's head direction cells all over the place and all kinds of circuits all over the place. Um, but in this particular one, did I answer that? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so what, what really struck me about this, I wanted to understand deeply why this worked. And um, I, can, I can follow their little example here. They're saying, oh, this cell's projected these, and these, these are these, what they call these transformation circuits. These are cells that sort of respond to both. They're like, this, this would be a cell. These are all these squares of cells. And this is a cell that responds to both the, um, uh, the idea, this, this star here, uh, uh, which is, I mean, I'm, I have a north egocentric cell, and it also responds to um, this down here, which means I have a, uh, an allocentric um, border. Uh, in this case, it's, they're showing it in the same area, but it doesn't matter. And so this kind of like, it, this would be a bit, it's like half allocentric and half egocentric. And it occurred to me that these, these cells might be like, uh, it, it, this proposal that these cells exist, is, these are like sort of the um, um, uh, conjunction, is it conjunction, is that um, conjunctive cells that we see a lot. Um, so, so anyway, so they have this, basically you have these, you have one vector here, and you have another vector here, then you have this matrix that they show it has to be fully 
filled in. So if it's four and four, then you have to have 16 of these intermediate cells. Um, if this were 10 and 10, you'd have to have 100 of these intermediate cells. Um, but then the trick to making this work is they say, oh yeah, we're gonna bring these other feedback, which is the head direction cells, and that tells me which of these cells to select, you know, something like that. So it's the intersection of these three things that are going on. Um, and so I, I can follow this, I could walk through the details, but I, I really was struggling, I still am to get a very deep understanding of this. It's like, yeah, I can see why it works, but it's like, I don't have an intuitive deep sense, but I'm getting it slowly. One thing I noticed right away is the thalamic head direction cells, or these head direction cells in general, they were already allocentric. So it's like, okay, yeah, I can solve this transform from an egocentric to an allocentric if I already know something about what the transform is. I already have another cell that tells me what the transform is. And so I can use that other cell. And so like, okay, well, how do, this, how do the head direction cells know which the right, you know, how do they get their answer? Because that's, they already presume they know the answer. They, they know, once you have a head direction cell, it says, yeah, I know, I know how everything has been rotated here because I'm not using egocentric head direction. So they don't address that. And in, in much, what, much of what I read about, about the head direction cells, People sort of say, yeah, it's gotta be some sort of sensory input, it's happening elsewhere, we don't really know about it. Um, there's, some, there's some theories about it. But I thought in general, that's, that's a, also a problem. That's part of the problem. We can't just assume that we know the head direction cell because that's the thing we're trying to solve. It's like saying, oh yeah, I know the answer already. Um, how to, you know, what's the right transform to do? But in general, you wouldn't know that. And we'd have, it's, the system has to figure out the head direction cell. So it occurred to me, this is just another vector. Um, and it's another vector that has to go from an egocentric to an allocentric um, um, representation from a, you know, an egocentric head direction, if you will, to an allocentric head direction. And that's just part of the problem. Um, and so I, then I realized, well, you could probably substitute any vector here that's allocentric. It doesn't, really matter. It doesn't have the head direction. I could pick another one. I could take border cells or I could take you know, location, uh, object vector cells or something. And if I knew the right answer for one vector, I could use it to answer the question for another vector. It's just like, oh yeah, I need a, I mean, somebody knows the answer, then I can tell everyone else what to do. Um, uh, does that make sense so far? Have I lost you? <laughs> I'll count this by. It, it makes oh. sense to me. Okay. So, um, then it kind of, and I had a whole bunch of questions about this. Could this circuit, first, the next thing I realized is that you're going to be doing a whole bunch of transformations at once. Um, and this is just for one cell type, right? But there's different vector cell types and so on. And then I realized I could be doing the same transformation for movement vectors. So I recently I've been talking about movement vectors in the cortex, like how many columns do represent movement vectors? How fast am I going in a particular direction? And I need to do the same transformation between I'm going forward in my body space to I'm going some direction in the object space. And so I could easily put an egocentric motor vector here and an allocentric motor vector here and it would solve that problem. So I said, well, that's good because I know I have to do that. I don't know if the cortex has to do boundary vector cells, but I know it's going to do mo motion vector cells. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. So I said, well, that's good. Now I have at least a beginning of a mechanism here. But I still don't, you know, I still have this mystery, like how do you solve this? But it then occurred to me, okay, I'm gonna throw out a couple of random thoughts and then I'm gonna leave it at that because I haven't really worked it all out yet. One random thought is you're gonna be doing this circuitry a lot and you're gonna do it in parallel. And it seems that any vector could help any other vector. Like anybody who's learning something about the transition can help anybody else learning about the transition. And so you, you could you can imagine here in these head direction cells, I could make this bi-directional arrow. Um, and it's just like these are bi-directional arrows. I, I can make these are bi-directional arrows. So I can have a whole bunch of allocentric vectors down here and a whole bunch of egocentric vectors down here. And, um, and they're all sort of coming together in some sense in this way. And this system will, will resolve the answer. Um, it doesn't tell me how I get started, but if I, knew the, if I knew the answer on any one of these, then I would be able to help the other one. It also occurred to me that I don't need, in a situation like that, I don't have to have every single variation here. It's probably perfectly okay to have a bunch of conjunctive cells or what they call these transformation circuits. I don't have to have every one. I could, I could have a, a, some subset of them and it would still work. It, 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 I just, that's an intuition. It, it says, yeah, I don't need to specify everything. It's just like our temporal memory doesn't have to make connection to everything. Um, you make a connection to the subset of uh, previous cells that are active and that's good enough. Um, something along those lines here. So, 
then this leads to sort of a, this general idea that there might be a very simple way of going between um, um, you have a set, you know, set of vectors in that one space and a set of vectors with equivalent sectors in another space, and they project to a set of uh, cells in between, and um, you don't have the full connectivity, and it doesn't have to be precisely uh, defined. I haven't proven this yet, but um, that if I start making progress at all, then the system will settle. Now, how do I make progress at all? The question is, if I know nothing about the world, um, uh, I wouldn't know where, I have no way of basically transforming from an egocentric to an allocentric mode of presentation. And, and the authors address that situation here, as do other authors in other papers. They say, basically, you have to have some sort of model of the world to give you a sort of a, um, some beliefs about what's possible in the allocentric side. So in this next figure here, um, uh, I don't think this figure is going to pertain exactly to the neocortex, but it's the basic idea. Here they're showing um, sensory input going to a egocentric vector, then through the, that transformation mat matrix, which, which they were saying was in the retrospinal cortex, but it was that transformation circuit, that's the n squared, that is neuron. And here they're making head direction cells as a separate input. I'm going to eliminate that to say you have a bunch of these guys. And then now over here, you have the allocentric vector cells. But um, what's different over here um, is that um, uh, I think it's this thing, identity here. They basically say, for this to work, you have to have some prior learned knowledge about what to expect and what the objects or what's the environment you're expecting to see. And so there's a, there's a learned representation over here which can feed back into the saying, well, you know, it could be this environment, that environment, or this object, and that object. So you give me some partial information, I will feed back what I think is possible. And this guy says, yeah, okay, you know, so they, they meet in the middle. This is purely sensory, and this is purely um, learned um, model of the world. And, and then you, you can, you know, go back and forth between them. Um, so th there's nothing new in this basic idea. But just seeing, the fig seeing this figure really got me going about this and saying, all right, we can figure this out. Um, I think I can come up with something, something as simple as, um, you know, in the cortex, you know, I can, I'll be able to map out, okay, layer four may be uh, e an egocentric um, feature and um, maybe, you know, lower layer three is an egocentric motion vector. And then uh, I'm just making this up, for example. Uh, I mean, so layer uh, 5A is the U.S. emotion vector. And when it may be part and parts of layer three are gonna be these transformation circuits. I really think this can be done. I think this is something we can map on the cortical column. So I'm, I'm very anxious to work on this further um, and try to figure out the very deep understanding about how you make these things and what, what, how, what number of these sort of um, in-between cells you might find, these transformation cells you need to get this to work. Um, so um, I, I'm pretty excited about this. I think this is, um, I, think, I think we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get an answer to this transformation and we'll be able to map it on the, uh, the column circuitry um, using this just basic figure as a launching point. So that's all I wanted to say about it um, at this point. And I won't work on it again uh, for at least a, until the beginning and middle of next week because I have to be working on the book until then. So that's it for, you know, people have questions. And, Want to discuss it? One one just uh, high level question that, uh, that I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are um, is we can, we keep kind of going back and forth how um, uh, let's see how how much a an actual physical space is being represented how, how much how much the space uh, the like these grid cells these boundary vector cells are representing actual vectors that align with physical space and how much is something something like uh vaguely different uh where it's, it might not be a strict spatial thing i i, I feel like we keep uh, going back and are forth you're saying, and you're saying and narrow in on spatial, you're saying a strict spatial thing like each space is different for each object or it's just that it's not really allocentric I didn't uh, that, that it might be kind of warped. It might be strange. I've used the example oh. before of, oh, yeah. of like, of like if uh, the, the playful example I use is you can imagine like in a soccer player's head uh, when he or she is running on the field, uh, if, if his or her continuous attractor uh, bump is going in a straight line, that might align with them running like a curve toward the goal. Like yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so we're, 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 we're not certain about that. You're right. 
Uh, I proposed that. I proposed that, you know, when I was talking about how you could have a spatial cooler-like mechanism looking at flow bit that you, you might end up with weird trajectories, right? That are spiraling or curving or something like that. Um, um, I've also gone back and forth between like each mini column is its own vector and therefore you have a lot of them, or maybe there's only like 10 and then, and, and the, and the, and then the, um, the slabs are all the same you know, variations of that. So, so that's another thing we've been waffling about. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think um, what's really exciting to me about this, this is another piece of the puzzle. So by really thinking deeply about how this circuitry could work and map into the cortical column, it might answer some of those other questions. It might move me towards like, oh, every mini column is this, or it might move me forward, all the vectors have to be, you know, linear in space, or maybe they don't have to be linear in space. Um, I th where I'm coming, where I'm, if, if you're following me, where I'm currently thinking on this particular issue you asked about, Marcus, is that even if, even if a motion vector is a curve, it's not going to be, it's going to be a, a, a smooth curve. It won't be a spiral. Well, it, it's not going to be a, a wonky curve, like, you know, go straight and turn and go, you know, it, it has to be something you can path integrate um, easily. And therefore, if it's a curve, it's going to be just an arc, you know, it's going to be, um, or if it's a straight line, it's a straight line. Um, it's not going to be a straight line, then a curve, you know what I'm saying? So, um, um, they're, they're, I'm, 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 I'm currently working under that assumption that, and, and, and there's the other issue too about the dimensionality of space, you know, do we even, can we even say what the dimensionality of space is, or do we just have a bunch of independent movement vectors, and that's all we care about? Um, I, I don't know. I, and, and I don't, it's not clear to me, like here there's a head direction cell in this paper, and that's a clearly what you need to, to convert in a 2D, 2D space, right? All you can do in a 2D space is rotate it. So, so that's simple. Uh, what happens in an n-dimensional space? I don't know. I, I'm confused by that right now. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just pointing out that I, I'm still confused. Well, I say confused. I'm still uncertain about many of these issues, but I think that this, thinking about this now, it gives me a new a new way, a new major piece of data that says, okay, every cortical column is going to be doing this. If I understand it deeply, then I can map that into the cortical anatomy. Um, and maybe that will answer the other question. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Super I'd say I'm, I'm in the same position of going back and forth between the two. Yeah, okay. More constraints, than, well, as I wrote in my book, you know, more constraints you have, it first makes it more confusing, but then eventually when the answer presents itself, then all the constraints get solved at once. Um, uh, Subutai made an interesting point. I had been working at, uh, just a little aside point here, I had been working up until this point in time, assuming that in a cortical column, there were two representations of space, like there'd be two sets of, um, uh, grid cells, one for one space and one for the transform space. And Sipatai made the point that that's not really necessary. And, and then I think he's right, meaning in a cortical column, I don't need, oh, I need an egocentric representation of motion and I need an egocentric representation of like sense features. But I don't necessarily have to have a, 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 a full space developed for that. Um, I can just convert those vectors, if I can just convert the motion vectors into an allocentric or a new reference frame, then, then all, the rep, all the grid cells and all the place cell equivalents would be in the new reference frame. So really, if I can just do this conversion on the input to the column, um, like the column starts off with one part, some cells representing motion in one, in one space and other cells representing motions in other space, then, I don't, that's, then once I've done that, then I can do all the modeling in the second space. I don't have to have place cells and grid cells in both spaces. We, we really freed up a lot of thinking on my part because now, I don't have to ask where the two sets of uh, grid cell equivalents are. I can say, I only need one. I need the, the, the new uh, transformed grid cells and transformed plate cell uh, equivalents. Uh, so that makes life simpler too. Anyway, okay, any other questions? All right. I'll be back on this in a week or two. <laughs> Everyone's still there? Yeah, yeah we're here. Okay. I didn't know if I was frozen. Very quiet. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. I think we're, we're done unless there's another topic. Um, I can briefly mention just oh, yeah. uh, the stuff about dendrites that I'm. Yes, oh, yeah, you were going to do that. Um, it's just, I, I talked about this a little bit while you were gone, the research meeting, but um, 
I have one slide that I showed then that I could show now just to get your kind of uh, reaction to it. Um, okay. It's just a different language for explaining the temporal memory. Okay. Um, hold on if I can. Okay, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing again, but uh, just one slide. I know, I know this slide. Oh. <laughs> I, I made this slide. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the, the reason I brought it up is that in thinking about how we can translate dendrites into uh, kind of machine learning that works, um, I was playing around with some a, a different way of explaining it. Um, and the way we typically explain it, this is just an example here, is that you know we have these mini columns, and uh, you know when you get an input, you get some uh, set of activity here. This causes some prediction in a in a, a sparse set of cells in the mini columns. Then when you get input, um, you know these cells win out, right? And they they you know they they uh, because they're depolarized, they win out and they become the active cells within the mini column. And the way this kind of prediction mechanism happens is that each of these cells get depolarized because they are connected to some set of active cells that were active just previously. Yes. Right. This is the kind of uh, language we've used to describe it. Um, what I think somewhat missing, and I mean, I think we all know this, but we often don't describe it this way, is that the once the network is trained, this is actually like a, a a very densely re recurrently connected network, right? So if you think about a temporal memory that's learned, let's say a thousand sequences, and each of them have, um, uh, you know, 10, 10 transitions, each transition, and you have 40 cells <laughs> on at a time, you have wow. actually something like 40,000 connections like this in this network. Oh, except they, you don't have to. You don't have to connect all four. You can connect to twenty. You don't, don't have to. You're, you're subsampling some. You know, some yeah. percentage of it. Okay, so maybe it's yeah. twenty thousand or something. Yeah. But it's still very densely recurrent, and this it's sort of lost in these figures. But there, we all assume it's there. The connection. Well, it's interesting. It's densely connected, but at any point in time, it's very sparsely activated. So exactly. So that's my know, second. I mean, when you think about neural networks being densely connected, you think about all the units are active and all the next units are active. But in the, yeah, it's, 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 not it's not dense in the sense that every unit is not connected to all of the other units. Um, but it's, it, is, it is a dense set of connections. It, it, maybe I shouldn't use the word dense. That's overloaded. Because it's, it's there's a lot of, me, there's a lot of lot, if, you look at the, if you look at all the cells together, it's dense. But if you look at uh, in terms of the uh, dendritic uh, segment, it's not dense at all. It's, it's not it's dense. dense. No, functionally, it's not dense at all. Yeah, and, and so but, each, but well, each dendritic segment, it, it's more like each dendritic segment, which is its own processing unit, and therefore each dendritic segment is very sparse. Connected. Yeah, so that's my second point, is that you have this, you know, ton of connections here, but you have very, very sparse subnetworks that's specific to each task or sequence. So if you have a sequence with 10 transitions, it's going to be a really sparse set of uh, a subnetwork within this much bigger you know, more connected network that's gonna be specific to each task. Yeah. And what the dendrites are basically doing is choosing which subnetwork to instantiate at any given point, which part of which subnetwork given the particular context. Yeah. Right, so even though you may have, you know, thousands and thousands of connections with the dendrites with any particular input, it's gonna choose 20 of them to become active. It's kind of a, a different way of saying the same thing, right? Yeah, okay. The dendrites are by depolarizing the cells, they're choosing which cells are going to win. And so they're going to choose, they're helping to choose which sub networks are, are, are winning. Um, uh, okay. Well, I mean, that's just yeah. saying the inputs. It's the, the same thing. It's the same thing. Well, the inputs to neurons determine which neurons are active. I mean, that's yeah, uh, yeah. pretty basic. Yeah. And, and so there's like a whole bunch of these really sparse sub networks, and they're being, you know, instantaneously kind of switched on and off depending on the context. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, SDRs avoid significant overlap and then, um, you know, the permanence is kind of within the weights are binary and the permanences choose which weights to make active via learning. So the permanences are kind of switching on and off the synapses as a, via learning, you know, which synapses yeah. are part of the subnetwork. Although, so, you know, the permanences are, you know, are, 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 the, the whole dealing with permanences, it's really sort of, um, 
a noise learning issue. I mean, if, if you just say, I know my data is perfect, I can run through everything and I, don't, I just set every, every synapse to one. I mean, it's, yeah, it, yeah. it's not inherent to the way that the network works. It's inherent to the way we want the network to learn. Uh, right. Humans just make, make a big difference there, but not in the final network. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, is this a different way of explaining it? And the reason I chose this way uh, is that there were, uh, and then described a bunch of papers which are uh, showing some properties in deep learning networks that we might be able to leverage. So one, one really interesting one was this um, paper called Supermasks, where they take a large network and then they instantiate very, uh, instantiate these subnetworks and they basically have binary weights in here and they're showing in that this case and, and explain this diagram there's three layers here so it's like the bottom layer and the middle layer are what a traditional network looks like and then the top layer is this mask which is the, the no this in the, this is like a typical three layer feed forward network okay uh and these uh thick lines showing which subset of the network they're instantiating at this point in time but where, what is the mask i don't know if the super mask is. uh the mask would just there would be one entry in the mask for each of these connections. And if there's a one, that means it's a, it's a thick line. So, right, so they imagine like a huge list of uh, zeros and ones, and here there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six ones. So they're saying, is, how, is this different, how is this different than just a sparse network where you say all the connections can't be? Uh, this is a sparse network, yeah. I mean, but how's it different? Why, how's super oh, because this, these are being switched on and off depending on what the task is. Oh, so and how do they decide have, to you, do that? Yeah, they actually have a densely connected network. And for task one, they sub switch on this subset. And how for do they task know, two, they how switch they, on the subset. How do they figure out what subsets to switch on? How do they choose those subsets? Um, they do it as a function of training. Uh, so there's a whole training process here that they, uh, okay. they figure out. Basically, they add and drop these things until they figure out. How do they, and then, and then when, you, when you're doing inference, how do they know what the task is? Or how do they resolve that? I mean, you they, don't know what the task is. Uh, yeah, so they basically pick the subnetwork that seems to fit the best. <laughs> so how do they do that? Do they, do they go through them serially, or do they resolve? Them yeah, they go things? they go through them serially. Um, well, they have a couple of different methods. Uh, you can you can do a linear sum of these all of these different networks, and then they try to find the subnetwork, the subset that gives the most confident response at the output. So there's they have a few different ways of doing it. I mean, they also that, I mean, one where they actually store it. They just know ahead of time that this this network is for task yeah. one, this network is for task two. It was so they have a variety of different ways. It seems to me this is a bit of a stretch uh, to where our, where our network works. I mean, I'm not sure where you're going with this, but in some sense, you know, the way the temple memory works is this stuff just gets automatically resolved. There's no thought about masks or, you know, which subset or putting a name on it or, uh, you know, nothing like that. It's like the data comes in and then it's, it settles on the right answer. Yeah, that's there's right. A point. So to, this does not seem it has that sort of property maybe, I don't know. Um, no, it, it, does, it does not have that property. So, so now what, what is your suggestion? So using the phrasing that you, you suggested, which is fine. I, I, I use that phrasing mostly as a way to introduce the discussion of these papers because there was a, a uh, couple of these papers I went through where the, they are basically choosing uh, they, the way they did continuous learning is they would have a bunch of these sub networks uh, uh, that they would switch on and off in different ways. So they have different schemes for doing it. So you're so you're basically saying we want to write up our continuous learning model or or whatever, right? Uh, you would you would want to use this language like of, of in terms of a super mask. Um, is that the idea? Yeah, I don't know if I want to ex use exactly their language. It was more as a context for drawing relationships with these papers that I was doing a review of. No, I think that's uh, great. I mean, yeah. I don't see how, how anyone could object to that. It seems like a good a good observation. Um, but you know, again, we have you want to be careful that the reader just doesn't. Oh yeah, I know what super mass are, you know, because it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, no, um, it's definitely not the same, uh, and I'm not yeah. suggesting it's the same. But it's it's analogous. What was interesting is in a deep learning context, they were able to, by doing this, they were able to have binary weights uh, and and show really good continuous learning results. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so that was. <laughs> wow, because <laughs> we, we were already there. We did that. Um, yes, yeah, so in a very, it, it, yeah, uh, I won't go through the results. No, but anyway, I, I, okay, it's, it's, well, that's, that's helpful for me, me to know what you're talking about. 
I do, I always think there's a risk that when we make these connections that uh, people on the machine learning side of the world will automatically assume they know what it is you're talking about. And, and then they just, you know, it might be hard to get the message across, but what actually how this thing works. So it's, you just have to be careful that you just have to be addressed that all the time. You know, it's like where it's, you run into the same thing when we're dealing with sparsity, right? Uh, the way sparsity is being implemented in, in, in traditional neural networks and the way it's sort of implemented in the brain are very similar, but not exactly the same. And yeah. so, you know, we, we, we have to dance around all the different parameters and talk about what we mean, what they mean. But I think it's, a, it's interesting. I'm, I think it's a good, I, I think it's good to make those connections because as you've pointed out many times, when people can start, they can at least relate to what you're talking about. Um, so if, I think what you're saying is you can say, well, here's a method for doing continuous learning. It's similar to supermass, but in this case, we do the following things differently. Uh, something along those lines, is that right? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how in the, it, it, we're pretty far from the papers. I don't know whether we would actually use the supermass language at all. Um, but I brought this so, up because I, I mentioned that I was thinking of some principles and tests of uh -huh. right? things. And uh, one of the tests I was thinking of is that we would be able to, the dendrites would be able to automatically figure out which subnetwork uh, it should so, choose. Just, so, it, like so, you're saying here, it's kind of artificial the way it's done. So um, if this is not for external people, right? You're saying then you, this terminology you just want to use internally. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't know if I'll use the supermass terminology. Um, I, I I think I would use the subnetworks. The fact that we're instantiating these sparse subnetworks. Uh, I think that's an easier. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. Uh, all right, all right, so I think that's an easier. I think that's an easier one, and might actually be quite a nice way to describe temporal memory, even to neuroscientists and to other you know, computational hmm. neuroscientists. Because I think they uh, get, I yeah. think people get lost in this dendrite. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Some of this it, well, you know, it's so funny, as it often is the case, that description as subnetwork wouldn't work for me, but this picture here that I made works beautifully for me. So, but that's this, I think this is my weirdness. Um, yeah, it works, this works for me too. Uh, I'm wondering whether, you know, it would also help to have a language, uh, an image yeah. where we show all the yeah. connections. And then just show yeah. how it's kind of dynamically switching yeah, uh, yeah. from one to the other. So I, I think that, I think it's great. So uh, this is more of an FYY for me because I missed it uh, in your early presentation, and I think you just wanted to hear my reaction to it. I think maybe. Um, yeah, the, uh, so I think and, and you're asking great. earlier this, uh, you know, the stand up when yeah. I was talking about the the tests I yeah. wanted to do. With them. Yeah, I think the the trick if we were describing this to other people is somehow when you showed those. Uh, the sub networks um, in, a, in a classic neural network diagram. What you're missing there is, is uh, it, 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 I think the idea that you have these dendrite, dendrites that are a part of the point neuron, mm -hmm. it's totally not visible there. It's not visible in our diagram either, by the way. We don't, you know, we don't show it in our diagram, but that, that yeah. part seems to be the hard part, perhaps for people just to get somehow. So that drawing of the subtask somehow doesn't convey that component, which is essential to making the whole thing work. Right. Um, so I don't know if that's an issue or not, but just I'm bringing it up that that would be something that's easy to overlook, you know. Um, yeah, I'm imagining we might show a picture of a unit just similar to our neuron paper where we show these yeah. connections and then show the whole. Uh, yeah, or, or maybe, yeah, or somehow each unit. Yeah, yeah, we show a unit, what a unit really looks like or something like right. that. I don't know. Yeah. I just, you know, I, I think this, you know, we've run into this many times with people when you talk about dendrites and why they're important. But just for many people, well, I know for neuroscientists and some machine learning people too, they just said, oh yeah, that doesn't really matter. You can just do that. We, we've already proven that you don't need those things because you just do a bunch, of, you have a bunch more point. Here. So um, that, that's a common reaction. So, but I like the idea in general. So thank you for showing that. Done? Any other reactions or anything to that? Um. Yeah, I have a quick one. So HTM, uh, as you described, also the recurrent connections are there to make it suitable for uh, sequence learning, right? So because we are in a scenario where uh, each new sample is dependent on the previous one, whereas in continuous learning, it's a different scenario. The tests have no dependence at all. So yeah, it doesn't so matter what previous tasks we've seen, the new ones just completely new. So tasks, I want right? to say it's not specific to sequences. Uh, so, in the, so in the in the neuron paper, we used it to learn sequences. 
but in general, it's you just have some context, and that context is used to select the sub work and the cells that which become active. Yeah. And in the so it, sensory in motor our, work, for example, the context could be a location vector, yeah. and that select there's no sequence. It's as yeah, so we we, we published two different contexts. One is the previous yeah. statement, which is the sequence, and Subhikai said the other one is the the location, um, allocentric location, and that and that works as well. Um, but I, you could provide any context, I guess. You could, I guess, it could be labels for, for images. I don't know what they would be. Yeah, it could, could be. It could. It could be labels. It could be. You know, we talked about feedback context. You know, coming into mm. apical dendrites or something. That's another type of context vector. We've had the idea of having a timing signal as a context. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very kind of generic property. It's a way to, again, use it. I'm trying this language out again. It's just selecting the sparse network that's appropriate for the given context and shutting off everyone else. Um, mm. it, it, it's, it's, making, it, yeah. Yeah, it's just a very, it's like you've learned a whole bunch of stuff, but you want to focus on one particular thing that's appropriate right now. And that's what, uh, and the nice thing is because we have so much sparsity, if there's ambiguity, we can actually have multiple things. You know, if the context is not sufficient to tell you uniquely what it is, we can have multiple sub networks active, uh, a union of them. And then over time we can, uh, figure out the, you know, make it more less ambiguous. Yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm, I'm trying to use this new language to see if yeah. how far it goes. <laughs> right. You, Did that make sense, Lucas? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and this idea of union would be the equivalent of the superposition, right? In the supermass. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yes. You know, although it's, they're using it, they, they actually they're using it in a different way. In our case, the superposition is uh, is to use to represent ambiguity. So if you have multiple things that are possible, you can superimpose them without losing each one um, because it's extremely sparse. In their case, they actually only have, it's not very sparse, so they can't really do this unioning the way we do it. They're using it more as a way of doing like an ensemble of experts, which is slightly mm. different. You know, they're doing a linear weighted sum of all of the sub networks to get at the inference, which is like a mixture of experts, right? which is different than what we're doing with res uh, representing ambiguity. Okay. You know, just hearing you say that reminded me that going back to what I was talking earlier about, remember the transform neurons I was talking about in the Burgess Vacancy model? Um, those cells that also have dendrites. And right, <laughs> you know, they show them as you know point neurons with three inputs, right? But but they would also have dendrites, and they'd also be doing the same property. So those transformation neurons would probably be exhibiting the same sort of context dependence. I'm not sure what that means yet, but uh, that's another thing I have to throw into my thinking about that model. I forgot about that. <laughs> Fascinating. So. Okay, um, I have something to ask, but I can ask after. Oh, yeah, after you, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can uh, ask I, I, not, I can ask after we uh, stop the meeting. Okay. You want to stop the recording, Marcus? Or?